It is in the shonen protagonist's blood, his very nature, to seek the exceptional, do the impossible, see the invisible, and so on. But sometimes, sometimes it's nice to look back, take it a bit slower, and just have a regular old, perfectly normal episode of Anime Music Club. Hi! Ikimashita! Hajimemashite! Watashi no emai wa Sanzikoban desu! Zura-san desu! Yoshiko no English, motherfucker, do you speak it? Français, mauvais baiser, you... est-ce que tu le parles? Portugais, filho da puta, você fala? Eh? Huh, well, that's an interesting response, but... Hi, I'm Sam Ziegelman. Hello, I'm Eddie, and I think I'm turning Japanese, I really think so. I'm Rana, and due to a rotoscopy accident, I am 2.5D. And I'm just the sound guy. What am I even doing here? Why'd you guys bring me into this? I'm just your editor, uh, man. Hi, I'm Galen. Nice to meet you guys. <laughs> well, at least... Well... Because it'd be good to have a little bit of outside input. I mean, how much anime music have you, have you listened to? None? Practically? <laughs> well, that's gonna be a problem, but I'm sure you can improvise something. Sure, I'll... I'll yeah, okay, I can try. Maybe you can think of some artists that you like. Work around that. That actually do some anime stuff. Yeah, we don't want to tank our ratings. Speaking of... <laughs> God, the buns, they hurt. Well, how do you think I feel editing you morons every week? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we're, t if we're talking about tank... I mean, what else does it say? It's the quint it's the quintessential anime opening. With Man, even no I know this one. <laughs> I disagree already, but continue. <laughs> with ja with jazzy notes and a and a lot and min and minimal vocals to accentuate the music actually being played, it's a fantastic anime opening for anyone j getting into anime music in general. Now, when I say I disagree, I don't mean the heresy, I don't like Tank, or else I would have been kicked out of this podcast for good reason, and I've been here for way too many episodes to do that kind of a heresy. However, uh, it's not what I would call a typical opening at all. Like, when I think archetypal anime opening, I'm thinking... Uh, idol song with a bit of a rock background, maybe, and something energetic to have your shonen protagonist run to, but not this masterpiece of a track that's just mm, so full of contained energy of uh, something truly unique that uh, only Yoko Kano could have given us at that time. It is. The soundtrack that was so good that they formed an entire band just to, to, uh, execute on it. So I'm the total anime noob, but Bebop is actually one of the few anime shows that I have watched, and um, it's really this song is really good. Even I know this one. Even the, yeah, I I I get the jam on this. Mm hmm. Like, it's got that piano line, it's got the, the, it's just, it's got a lot going for it. Already you know what you're saying. <laughs> well, if we're talking about earlier anime openings, I mean, there's Bebop, there's, what other ones are you guys thinking about for that? Like the early legends, mm. because Bebop is kind of in a in a category of its own, honestly. Yeah, I'm not sure I would qualify it as an early legend. I mean, one anime itself has been around since the '70s, and I believe this show was the '90s. Um, uh. and two, uh, it really kind of is off in its own little world. It doesn't feel like an anime show in any typical way. So the music doesn't feel typical at all either. Yeah. It's... Especially because of how much care and attention they gave to the music in the uh, 
anime itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. Much like its follow-up of... Samurai Champloo, the music was almost the music was almost the point. A, a lot of shows <laughs> very back then comparison. used to a lot of shows back then used to actually go for some sort of pop rock or hard rock opening. This one just full on bebop jazz. Yeah. <laughs> Which you know makes sense given the name. Yeah. Um. No, this this one was really kind of carving. Maybe that's the reason I actually like this show because hey, guess what? I made it pretty clear I don't really like anime that much, guys. So I'm really the outsider here. <laughs> um. It's okay, we like you anyway. Thanks, appreciate it, guys. Yeah. You um, can join the anime club as long as you bring some snacks. I do like Japanese food very, very much, so I will absolutely bring some dorimaki for everybody. Yeah. Um, I'll definitely, I'll definitely bring a couple uh, fun Kit Kats. Mm. Good choice. Green tea Kit Kat is, like, I know that's, like, the basic Japanese Kit Kat, but, like, it's so good, like, why do you even need more? Yeah. Uh, speaking of jazzy, um, I mean, if we're talking jazzy, we're talking Helsing. I like this song a lot. This one had me grooving in my chair. Yeah, Helsing is another one of those where the the entire soundtrack's kind of in a, cat, uh, a category of its own. It's got some blue stones, some jazz stones. If you go into the actual soundtrack proper, it's very psychedelic, and the sound, uh, the the track titles go bonkers. But this this opening is just it oozes coolness, and as someone who has studied the piano for, admittedly not <laughs> very long, I just love the piano and the I, the bass. I thought you were going to say, as someone who oozes a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Gross. You um, should take some medication for that, I think. Yeah, I've <laughs> spent a lot of time around the piano, and God, it's so it's jumpy, funky, it's all that good. The drum line fills out the space. So it's kind of funny because the proper soundtrack goes some weird places. <laughs> oh yeah, but you know, you gotta draw the audience in somehow. Um, yeah. Japanese music has a tendency to push for too much. This mm -hmm. song does not do that. This song kind of plays it cool, and I think that's to its benefit. Yeah, like, there's another world where this uh, opening would be the most edgy, new metal, super I'm emo, and I'm letting every single one of the people that join my sky blog know it uh, kind of vibe. Um... Instead, they went the other route. They went with the guy who knows he, he's cool and doesn't need to prove it. Yeah, there that's is what this track is. There is Which probably is the a world where the opening to this anime was composed by Limp Bizkit. Probably. <laughs> and we're going to be talking about similar music well. later, but we're going to hold oh, off yeah. on that one. Um, um, so yeah. I'm reminded when I hear this song, of basically what you just said, of a show on HBO called The Wire. Now hear me out on this one. Okay. So in season two of The Wire, there was this one dock worker who was this absolute giant guy, and you saw the, like, culture of the dock workers in that show, and they were all, like, very, like, had their own specific kind of definition of masculine. And this guy just did not care. He would go to Starbucks and order the fanciest frappuccino he could, and the one of the principal characters named Ziggy, named, uh, played by James Redstone. He just went after this guy, thinking that this guy was some kind of, like, wimp because he ordered the fancy Frappuccino drink and not, like, the manly black coffee drink. The thing is, he failed to realize kind of exactly what you were saying, that he didn't need to prove himself to anybody, so he effortlessly, like, puts Ziggy on top of a container and sends him up to the top of the stack and kind of just strands him there for several hours as revenge for this guy trying to go after Ziggy, uh, trying to go after the big guy. And I'm 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 just kind of thinking of that scene. Like this song is the musical equivalent of that. It has nothing to prove to yes. other anime. It's just there. It's making its own point. I really kind of have a lot of respect for that sort of composing. Yeah, and I think that it that with how you're describing, um, it's sort of this whole track sort of encapsulates what Alucard, the protagonist of. Uh, 
Helsing is. He oozes confidence. He never like he doesn't have to tell people that he's cool because he just walks in and messes stuff up. And then a thousand people did not understand that and make and made Helsing AMVs. Mm -hmm. And then they made Helsing Ultimate, where everything is very edgy. Ah, uh, sad. The only Where's Helsing I'm straight? really familiar with is Helsing Abridged, and even then just one episode that I thought was very funny. Helsing Abridged is based off of Helsing Ultimate, which they worked around uh, the negatives of it, but... It's a thing. It's a thing. I, I think Team Four Star does great stuff, and I think that the original Helsing is great. Um, shall we move on to the next one? Or do we have still something to say about Helsing? Yeah, I think it's next next one up. Then let's move on to Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei, So Long Professor Despair, and the long -time second listeners, opening. Long time listeners may have noticed that I go for the anime with the short names. <laughs> Ranako just pulls no punches. Never. I don't even know what these words are. <laughs> well, I just translated them. So long, Professor Despair. And cool. uh, Kuso Rumba, which is a song that has a few notes of Rumba in it, and the word Rumba in it, certainly, but it's mostly some metal that just goes. Uh, I, wow, no. No, it just mm. uh, no. I disagree. I'm I'm the one of the resident metalheads here, and I'm like, okay, this is a cool intro. This is a cool intro. The vocals kick in, and it yeah. descends into <laughs> utter madness. Uh, I'm, well, I'm not uh, even metalhead, and I felt I'm not even metalhead myself, and I felt a little bit off put. That's a madness. By... Is the name of the game, honestly. I felt very much cheated of a very a much better music. Same. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I disagree. I disagree. I like the contrast. I like the clash. It's some hardcore stuff, uh, but it takes itself so seriously, it's willing to shoot itself in the foot as a joke. I mean, the clash is actually a good band. This isn't. <laughs> Okay, to give you an idea about how well it fits the anime it's from, since I assume you haven't seen it. You are correct. You are correct. Uh, that's not the only opening from this season, because they have one episode that's a murder mystery for no apparent reason, and they completely change the opening as well. I appreciate the effort. To, just to make it a joke. It's the kind of thing that demands you stop trying to uh, uh, draw a timeline or have any sort of coherence and just sit along and enjoy the ride. A little bit like uh, Chromati, for instance. I don't know what that is either. Neither do I. Oh, I think you'd like Chromati, actually. Is okay. that back me up on that one, maybe? Uh, I've said neither do I. <laughs> Oh, come on! Uh, I think you're alone know, on this hill, buddy. I, I, I know many anime. I do not know that one. I hear Cromarty, I think the Sarah Connor Chronicles. Yeah, well, it's named for a reference. But not this one, I don't think. Mm. Yeah, anyway. Uh, yeah, no, it just embraces the high-pitched anime girl voice along with the uh, metal tracks and I respect it. You that. see, I, I would agree with you for the anime girl voice, except there are much better high-pitched anime girl voices out in anime. Just in I general, there's also better... Also the voice actor for one of the characters? They do that a lot. I've noticed that a lot of Japanese uh... Actors also sing on their shows. That's that's been yeah. a fairly uh, recurring theme, from my understanding. That's sort of one of the things with uh, Seiyu in Japan, uh, the name for voice actors there, that they work many different facets of both of singing, of doing, uh, making their own bands, 
or being voice actors or actresses. A lot of promotional actresses. stuff as well. Yeah. Uh, I'll have a thing to talk about with that later. Well then, let's move on to your pick for the opening section of this episode. So what do you have, Gail? I don't know what Attack on Titan is, other than apparently Koai released a really weird Dynasty Warriors game about it. I do know that the music sounds like one of my favorite bands, a band called Epica. And in return, Epica went back and did music based on Attack on Titan, so I just picked an Epica song. Um, so before I begin... Okay. I have a very long history with this band. Um, I've been seeing them in concert for over ten years. I have seen them a bunch. I met one of my best friends on the planet in a in line to an Epica show at I think it was the Key Club in Hollywood back when that was still open. And uh in fact, uh I have spoken to Eddie a few times about Epica as well, and we have very differing opinions on that band. Yeah, j just a few a few times on on occasion. Um I'm also a person with a long story with, with a band. Uh, it started when I was a teen. Uh, I was a big fan. I kind of still am of a, another band called Camelot. And Epica used to uh, collaborate with them a lot. Yep. And so I listened to a lot of, a lot of Camelot's uh, albums. In fact, the uh, lead singer of Epica, Simone Simons, and uh, the keyboardist of uh, Camelot, Oliver Palatai, have a child together. Hmm. Yeah, yes. Yeah. A poor marriage to make sure that the royal family continues. <laughs> uh, you know what? It You're is not the world entirely of power wrong. Metal. It so is the world of saying? power. It's the world of power metal. Power metal does. Okay. does what was things Galen like saying? I was just agreeing. No, okay. Power, power metal does have its its influences in in medieval stuff, so. Might as well be. But yeah, I've I've been listening to bands like them since I was a teenager and, and to a pilgrimage to a, a long long. shrine where I, I discovered um, Epica albums and I listened while a Buddhist uh, monk taught me about their ways. And on the way uh, back, I also hitched a, a ride with a, a dragon to, to arrive home. Uh, and then I started actually... Wait, is the dragon related to the giant whale you mentioned? No, no, the the, the whale was a different thing. Uh, the the whale sadly the whale died. It's uh, I don't want to get into that. It's a bit oh, boring. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, I I I hitched a ride on on a dragon to get back home, sadly, and uh, the the CDs didn't work, so I had to grab a spell book to do some incantations. Otherwise, because... I couldn't listen to them, and uh, I didn't like it. I, 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 I'm not, not a fan. Mm. Um, maybe you were using the wrong incantations. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, I, I it's that Square Enix formatting that doesn't work with these incantations. Well, what would be magical is if Epica put two good albums out in a row. Uh, Epica is a real hit or miss band. When they are good, they are, at least to me, utterly fantastic. But when they are bad... Much like a guy, a video game composer you guys probably don't know by the name of Otoi Sakuraba, when uh, they decide, please, this is an anime. I podcast. know, I know. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make comparisons to things as I actually know. You're the guys who brought me out of this show. Fine, what are you doing? Fine. I Fair never enough. heard of that guy. Never heard of that guy. Um, but much like that guy, when they decide they want to kill a song, that song dies bloodily and painfully. <laughs> Uh, and unfortunately, this particular song, which is a take on the opening music to Attack on Titan, is one of the songs they have killed to a truly drastic degree. I hate this song. I hate it. I love yeah, this band. As I someone with an opposite view on Epica, who, uh, I generally tend to dislike Epica. When I first listened to this track, at first, I enjoyed it because it was different. It was new. Uh, it didn't, it didn't, that, that, that sensation didn't last much more than about 15 seconds, though. Yeah, it's like they try to have, to bring a different energy, and they are like, you know what would be nice? No energy at all for a couple seconds. Okay, back on track. 
Okay, no energy, no more. Yeah. Okay, back on I track. have I have words to say about this one. Um, the well, original, the original, Link to Rising Gurendo Yumiya. Uh, of this, which Epica made the re, the remix uh, called Gr Crimson Bow and Arrow, Bow and Arrow, which is the translation of Gurendo Yumiya, is a. Orca is an orchestral piece. It's mainly an orchestral piece that uses its electric instruments in order to amplify the uh, orchestra around it. Yeah, which bring the sense of scale to the whole track. Epica kind of does the opposite. Epica use these crazy metal power instruments and it and diminish the orchestra and that just made the whole thing just feel hollow. What's funny is they don't usually do that. Um, Kun Janssen is probably one of the most prolific members of the band, and he's usually, like, very kind of, at least musically, up front and center. The orchestrations are kind of their whole thing. But I have a kind of a theory about that. It's like, if they're going to remix a song that's based on their own work, if they just copied the original song as is, What's the point of doing it in the first place? So they had to do something different, so they may as well go guitar heavy. I, I don't necessarily disagree that it sounds hollow. As I said, I really don't like the song, but at least I understand the, like, narrative, not the narrative. At least I understand the thought process that led to this. I can, I can as well. I just feel like where the power of the original Gurendo Yumiya actually stands, they, like... Even though, like, they they do want to try and pull it back to their own stuff, it just feels like they didn't hit the mark at all. Yeah. Um, but There's one particular musical decision that I really, really question, which is breaking up the song to add bits where it's pretty much just guitars and Mark Jansen doing his trademark growls, which don't fit this song at all. Nope. Um, oh. This is one of those songs where Mark should have just shut up and stayed out of it. And it's not like Epica doesn't have songs where Mark just shuts up and stays out of it. They have plenty. He's usually only on half to two-thirds of an album. I mean, as a singer, as a guitarist, he's obviously on every song. Um, But he didn't. He just... It, this re <sighs> This song is a mess. Like, this... This was their off album right after the Sala System, which was an EP they put out that was absolutely fantastic. And I'm like, I'm listening to Architect of Light, which is one of Epica's better songs, right next to this. So they were only released like less than a year apart from each other. And I'm like, the difference is night and day, despite having a lot of the same elements compositionally. But Architect of Light is just so much better constructed. It's so much more interesting. I wish they'd taken that songwriting and put it into this, but nope, they can't. This was their album down. This was their bad one. Um, and before the Solar System EP was an album called The Holographic Principle, which is one of their worst albums. Again, it's a down album. Before that was The Quantum Enigma, which was a great album. That was their up album, etc. You can see the pattern here. It's very much a Star Trek curse kind of pattern. You know, one good one, one bad one, one good one, one bad one, one good one, one bad one. Um, this was they their bad keep... one, and this was really, really, really bad. They must follow the, the pattern to keep balance in the cosmos. They must. If they were too good constantly, they'd probably break the world. Um, Mark Jansen has some unfortunate uh, songwriting choices that he's made over the years. Um, well, good news, because Attack on Titan has some very unfortunate choices as well. So that's a match made. Yeah, heaven. that's a very good fit. Um, in fact, Mark Jansen's side project, Mayan, is one of the most unlistenable things on the planet to me despite having members who I actually, like, really like from all over the symphonic metal and power metal world. Um, I, I have to, to uh, intrude a little bit and add my opinion and say that I'm so happy I'm not the only one who thinks that. Oh, yeah. Dude. It, it's, 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 I listened to their first album, but I'm just like, this is awful. It's all of Mark Ganson's worst writing impulses. Meandering, unfocused. Just throw everything at the wall and see what sticks, and then just throw it at the wall, and if it doesn't stick, do it anyway. It, it It's a mess, and Mark does this, and he does this on Epica tracks sometimes, and it felt like he had a little too much input on this particular song. 
for all of those same reasons. I, I have nothing good to say about this one. Thankfully, after this Attack on Titan nonsense, their next album, Omega, actually, which was just this last year, I think, uh, was actually, like, very good Epica album and just what we needed in the height of the pandemic. So I'm actually... They recovered from this. This wasn't the end of their... This wasn't the end of their musical career, thankfully. They have an album up again, and then their next album's gonna be bad, because that's just how they do things. Dude. So, for context for this next one, I... I started getting into anime music and stuff like that when I was in middle school. It, I started out with, like, liking video game music and starting to, like, integrate that into my everyday listening. And then I got into anime around the end of middle school. What? Getting into anime in middle school? Or high school? Crazy! That's never happened to anyone. Never. I know. I know. Couldn't be me. Could, <laughs> Couldn't be me. Um, but it wasn't like it wasn't my first anime that got me into it. That was like, uh, like at that time, current uh, isekai trash, whatever. What was that called? I forget ex exactly what that was. Oh, right, Sao. Um, but what really hooked me into anime music was an anime that I found purely off of the music from it. First of all, congratulations on seeing SAO and thinking, yeah, right, I'm going to continue and not drop that entire thing declaring anime trash. Mm -hmm. You would have had all the reasons to at, do it. At that time, I had middle school brain of, this is decent. Fair, fair. Um, but for all the things that Guilty Crown can suffer from, music, I will never, ever fault it for. Because I haven't watched the anime, but you tell me so or no, I tell you, okay, I'm on board. Between, e between, e between Egoist's opening and Sawano's tracks, Guilty Crown has one of my favorite soundtracks of all time and the soundtrack that is the central the centerpiece for the entire anime is the, is the track bios i like this song this is a good song yes it this is it goes from an acoustic flow like build of like okay we're starting like it gets the it's that good spine tingle at the beginning, like, oh yeah. It, it's a very, very good mid-tempo rock song with a soft intro. Like, it, it isn't really doing anything special or, like, too, like, too, like, out there. But, um, once again, it's kind of, it, it's kind of resisting that normal anime urge of too much, that normal Japanese urge of too much in general. Um... And it's just being a chill rock song, and there's something to be said for it. The The composition is really good. Now, I only really know this composer from, oh, guess what? Here, me, I, here I am again talking about video games. I know you guys don't like that on the show. I know. But I only know this composer from a game called Xenoblade Chronicles X. Um, Get this gamer out of here! I know. You invited me! <laughs> What did you Hashtag expect? Hashtag gamer moment. <laughs> no, definitely not, thankfully. Um, I mean, what? <clears throat> you were saying? <laughs> yes, Xenoblade Chronicles 10. Yeah, 10, exactly. Um, now, I didn't really like that soundtrack so much, but this song is really kind of Sawano's best... Um, kind of, kind of Sawano's best points. Uh, it just really flows well. I appreciate it. I'm I'm surprised with how much I enjoyed it because I'm usually not very much a fan of uh, these uh, slower to mid tempo rock tracks. Uh, but this one works really really well. Really really pleasant is how I would uh, describe it. 
It's very constructed because of its status as a centerpiece, I feel. Mm -hmm. Which means that it's maybe getting a bit less free-flowing Savano stuff. Which is why he can appeal to people that aren't into a lot of his work. And there are a lot of variations to uh, this track throughout the anime. Slower versions, versions with a little bit more zhuzh to it. Um, so but... you mean to say it's the Libera Me from Hell of Guilty Crown? Yeah. It's... It functions as the motif of the whole the motif of the whole anime. And what a motif what a motif it is. Jumping off from light motifs, Eddie, if you wanna go on to your next track. And I mean, if we're speaking of uh light motifs in anime, I think a very iconic uh case study, let's say of an anime that uses light motifs a lot is the 2003 the first anime for the Fullmetal Alchemist franchise and uh, pretty much the entire soundtrack is light motifs being used in different ways with the exception of like a handful of songs and um i i just i'll just say guess who brought a classical song to this podcast yeah, oh, I'm gee, shocked. I wonder who. Shock and awe. Yeah, so, uh, this one, uh, the title in English is Dancing. I, I don't know the original title of the, of the track in Japanese. By, uh, it's by Mishiro Shima. I've become a big fan of hers after this soundtrack. And it's basically the culmination of the theme of the homunculi, who are the villains as well as the theme of Dante, who is the big mm. villain of this, well, this series. The antagonists. Yes. So, I was only exposed to uh, FMAB, FMAB uh, yeah. but only because of the fact that like I read the manga of Full Metal Alchemist and then was told, Brotherhood's the anime version of that. I'm like, okay. Uh, but going back and listening to this track, it was a very nice, quiet, waltzy piece that felt well, suave in a way. It, you say waltzy, but that's n kind of a misnomer because it's not waltzy. It is just flat out a waltz. Fair enough. It, it is precisely in waltz tab as well. And it's it actually plays in a very... Um, very natural way within the the show. Uh, ah, that there, there reassures a, me a lot. There, there isn't like an orchestra playing it, but it plays when there are characters dancing. It's from a scene uh, near the end of the anime where Dante, the antagonist, has the main character, Edward, uh, basically where she wants him, and she starts dancing with him as a way to taunt him. And this song plays in the background, so it it has that flowery waltz vibe to it, but it has a darker undertone because it's the villain taunting the the main protagonist. In in that way, I had written down uh, that it feels suave in a way of like th it knows what it's doing, and in that case, like, Dante knows what they're doing. Um, as I said, I'm mostly reassured because the uh, I did watch the original Full Metal Alchemist instead of Brotherhood, uh, and I should watch Brotherhood at some point, don't worry. But uh, the music didn't really leave an impression besides, of course, the opening, and Melissa is better than where the steady go. Uh, but overall, it didn't really leave an impression, so the fact that it's very integrated, uh, very natural flow in like that, uh, is means that it's not forgettable, but just discreet and knowing where to stand compared to the action. Um, and yeah, for me, FMA, the first one, the first FMA, 
is one of the few animes I've watched as well, mostly because I was watching it with my roommate at the time, and he was a big fan. Never mm. saw Brotherhood. I have no desire to see Brotherhood. I don't care enough. But, um... Heresy. Mm. It Brotherhood is the... Uh, so, Full Metal Alchemist at, was actually... They continued the anime on after and created an, an, an anime-only ending for that because of the fact that the manga was not complete by the yeah, time that the uh, anime was out. It's a fruit basket situation. Mm-hmm. Which means that the more recent Fruit Basket should be titled Fruit Basket Brotherhood. No, I will not apologize. I hate it, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Fruit Basket, which was my more modern-ish, as modern as 2003 can be anyway, modern introduction to manga. Yeah, I... But that's besides the... Full Metal Alchemist point. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'd say as far as the soundtrack goes, uh, the general perception that fans tend to have is that Brotherhood has the better soundtrack, but uh, I find the soundtrack to the 2003 anime to, me, to be a, a much better listen. Uh, not in the sense of the tracks are superior or anything, but they are... A, they provide a better better experience when I have them completely divorced from the original context of the anime, uh, with some exceptions like a track for funny moments and such. I generally have an easier time just listening to the uh, Mishiro Oshima tracks on my own time than I have listened to the Akira Senjo tracks from Brotherhood on my own time. They work better within the anime, in my opinion. <clears throat> But I am a classical fanboy, so I might be biased. I can appreciate the cla the classical fan eyes. I enjoy classical a lot, and it. Oh my god, this, this is driving me crazy. Is this isn't great. classical music. It's not from the classical period. Waltzes are romantic period, which is after classical. So this is the age of Beethoven, not the age of Mozart. I'm I'm losing my mind over here. <laughs> Yes, to be clear, when we're saying the word classical, we're using the the casual uh, perception of it. But uh, as far as but now her you inspiration, know better. Yeah, uh, yeah. As far as her inspirations go, Gillen is is right on. Her inspirations are pretty much that era of Western music as well as Japanese uh, folk music, which you can yeah, you check know out your in, stuff in about. Answer. Yeah, you know your stuff about music in general. We should invite you more often. Yeah. Thanks. As I long as you edit the episode on guys. time. I'm working on it. <laughs> Work faster. Oh, well, y'all don't pay me enough for this. Wait, someone's paying you? Wait, someone's getting paid? Wait, what money do we have? Wait, quick, the next song! Well, you know what happens when people don't have enough money? They wait after class for the bento that are about to run out of date and get quickly half priced. And since there's not enough bento uh, to go around for everyone, they fight for it. This is uh, the actual plot of bento whose track I gotta turn it on is, it is from. <sighs> Your transitions are always a bit painful, but I think that's a yeah. new record. I I will say that while it's well, it was definitely something. Doesn't describe how it how the anime is. This track definitely le lends itself uh, to the thought of like just a quiet moment before kicking into a fight scene. Yeah, exactly. That's how it's structured. They wait until the king of the region, i.e. the uh, uh, manager puts the stickers on the bentos that are about to go out. He run off the stuff from the area as the track builds up and up, and then it explodes into complete chaos 
as allies fight against allies and hordes starts punching each other. Some just to punch people, others because they're hungry. Yeah. And it's reflecting this chaotic energy very well. Complete chaos yeah. is a very good descriptor of this song. Yeah. Um, this song is balls out insane. Uh, <laughs> Me? I, yeah. Insane songs? Yeah. <laughs> I Shocking, never. right? Um, Certainly I, not three times in an episode. I gotta be honest here, we went from, like, a Chopin waltz to now T-Pain, because does this vocal <laughs> have enough auto-tune and vocoder on it? Is there a real person behind this, or is this all computer? I can't tell if there's actual person singing. This could just be made up, this could just be programmed. That's how, I, that's sure how is. electronic I, it is. Definitely, sure I, must be envious. If, if, I remem if I remember correctly, this was a 2000, like, Six, eight, anime? Oh, time flies. Autotune has been around since, as Eddie just implied, Cher. So, no, you totally have that as a thing that exists. In fact, she's so bad at singing that they basically invented autotune for her. That said, she's still very clearly a real person and has charisma. I can't say the same about this vocalist. Yeah. And this is what... We we were talking about earlier of animes uh want to go over the top yeah this is this, we were talking about not being too much this song is too much me is, picking songs that are too much again i've got to ask are you a lady gaga fan you seem like you would be with some of your picks <laughs> that's not even a joke i'm actually no. asking i haven't looked into it i may become one if i get into it I feel like she'd be your style. I'm not even joking when I say this. I like a lot of yeah, her work. I'm, I'm not even. I'm not trolling right now. Yeah, I know. I I, I, I know don't take not it as a roast. I, I'm I'm Maybe just I laughing should. because I never thought about it. But you're right. Right. Yeah. Too much is kind of her brand. Anyway, look, sorry. I'll, I'll I'll stop interrupting now. Look, all I remember is meat dress, and that's. <laughs> There's way more to her than meat dress, trust me. Yeah, I know. As pop acts go, she's actually, like, when she wants yeah. to be good, she's great. Yeah. Yes. We're way but... off topic. Let's get back on <laughs> random fighting over food. Wouldn't it be easier for these kids just to get a part-time job or something? You think? Yeah, but then you, you don't have the thrill of the hunt. The thrill of knowing that you are a wolf and not a dog. So Black Friday the anime, got it. Yeah, exactly. That's actually Black Friday Fight Club. One of Epica's best uh, songs is Freedom Wolves with it, and that's about wolves, so, you know, I can get back into that now. Sp speaking about fighting, uh, let's move on to the next track. <laughs> Fine. But not before I've mentioned that if you go to watch uh, Bento, it's 12 episodes, Six that are surprisingly good, and six that then take how positively surprised you are and ruin everything to break you. In a, like, bad writing way or in a Taro Yoko sort of way? In a bad writing way. Let's build you in six episodes for a specific fight and then not actually show the fight. Aww. Kind of way. <sighs> That makes me sad. That it's made so you sad too at the time. But it's so entertaining when main plot points that have been built up for ages are resolved off screen. I, I don't know why you're so sad. Yeah, that's always wonderful, isn't it? And great and terrific. And come on, guys, don't do this. To me. Oh God. Don't Next they say song. tell speaking don't of, show? Speaking of disappointment, let's talk about the next track. Well, let's talk about the movie that the next track comes from first real quick. So I can sound like I know what I'm talking about. So I'm a pretty big Street Fighter fan, even though I'm terrible at the games. Games um, again. No, 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 no. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. This, this is relevant, please. Don't, don't hurt me. Um, yes, games again. But this one actually had an anime adaptation that was really good. Yeah. So we're going to talk about the anime for a second. You good yeah. with that? You cool? I mean, okay, K okay cool. K KOF had its, own, had its own anime thing, so Street Fighter counts as well. Yeah. Um, so Street Fighter 2 had a really shockingly good anime with 
that was way better than the 1993 movie, which was it 93? No, the movie was way after that. It was like 97. Admittedly, that's not a high bar. I mean, you say that, but Raul Julia's performance as yes, Bison is I utterly was going iconic. To add, I was going to add Bison notwithstanding. Fair enough. Yeah, no, that, that was, that was, yes. Of course. Of course. <sighs> okay. Good. 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 It took me a second. That took me, like, yeah, okay. Um, but the anime was actually, like, really good. And also, one of the voice actors, for uh, those of you who are unaware of the fact that he used to do voice work, was actually a young Brian Cranston, now probably best known for Breaking Bad or oh. the new Godzilla movie. Huh. Oh, I yeah, the Malcolm in the Middle guy. Yeah. I believe he played Fei Long. I'm not looking at the cast list, but I believe that's who he voiced in the dub. Huh. But one weird thing about the dub that always threw me off was that it actually used a lot of modern at the time uh, music as part of its localization. A lot of new metal. And I feel like there was some influence from the live action um, Mortal Kombat movie, which had a similar musical conceit. It used like KMFDM and bands like that. In this one, the closing credits of the Street Fighter 2 anime was, of all things, Blind by Corn. Mm. Now, uh. when I think of a fight flow, I think of not that. Right. Yeah. Not really great fight like, music. Okay, with, with how much you dislike Gotta Turn It On, you've got to admit it's more of a fight in music than this one, right? Oh, yeah, no, I don't like the song, but the energy's at least there. Good. Mm -hmm. This one is, well, for one thing, it's actually one of Korn's, like, worst songs. And I say that as someone who, while I would not call myself even remotely a fan, I at least respect what they were, what they were trying to accomplish. Don't call the track corny. Don't call the track corny. Don't call the track corny. I, I would say it's not that. I, I, it's yeah, not good, I, but I wouldn't call it corny. Like, I, I, I can't even really use the pun with the straight face. It's just not accurate. It's just not well written. Yeah, that, that's it's... why I had to hold myself back from that. Fair enough. Um, now, I say this as someone who, in one of the, in the single biggest concert of my life, Chord was one of the bands that was playing. And that was 1999 Summer Sanitarium Tour. And that was Metallica, Korn, Kid Rock, Power Man 5000, System of a Down. So I have seen this band live and liked them a lot live. Yeah, just five little unknown bands. Yeah, probably the least oh. well-known is actually Power Band 5000, and even they have a pretty solid following. Yeah. Uh, I'm not... Uh, I'm probably, admittedly, the least metal fan person in the group, though I still like it from time to time. It just... It didn't hit any notes for me, and in the parts where, like, they were trying to drive for something, it just didn't hit. Yeah. Well, I mean, this if, comes if off it of serves their... as, If it serves as, as consolation, I'm the other resident metalhead, and uh, I, I just didn't like this at all. I don't know many people who do like this song. This is before... This was from Korn's first album. This is before they found their groove. Um, and I do believe they did find a groove, especially on their second and third albums. Um, I find myself comparing this to probably their biggest hit, Freak on a Leash, which musically and compositionally is very similar to, but Freak on a Leash is a far, far superior song. Even if you don't like it, you could tell there's a lot more compositional detail, a lot more attention paid to the writing. Um, as, like, anger ballads go, that one is far, far superior, and this one's just a mess. But that brings me back to the original question. What does this have to do with Street Fighter at all? It doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't. Even in a vibe manner, uh, speaking. Um, the vibe I not, get not that from I it. know anything of that, but I imagine if some band were to do a track uh, as to open one of the Street Fighter games named Indestructible, I bet it would sound somehow more fight game fighting game music even this yeah the vibe that i got from this track was that it was a very incompetent uh attempt at doing uh linking park crawling i think yeah. this predates crawling by like four years though i, I this one definitely came first 
Because I think Hybrid Theory was 2001? I think some, somewhere along those lines. Yeah, yeah and this mm -hmm. was like 96, 97. Again, this was Korn's first album. It, it doesn't... The bottom line is that it, it doesn't really come off as very competent. It really isn't. And it was kind of weirdly popular in the mall metal circles. Um... It definitely seems like maybe it was either either Rush or corporate something. I don't know. Uh, well, it's that, definitely not corporate. I mean, that's for sure because this was like this was it. this was their more garage metal days. But even then, mm -hmm. like even then, like their actual like their 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 second album, which was a lot more corporate. I believe it was Arista Records. Don't quote me on that one. I have not read the label on that thing. I I don't even know where the CD is. It might be lost to the Aether because that was like yes, I bought that CD. I was in high school at the time. What do you want it's for me? It's okay. We all were young. Yeah, I I we've all made mistakes. <sighs> I made a mistake being accepting your invite to be on this show. I don't know what you guys want for me. The input um, that you're giving. <laughs> fair enough. No, I, 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 this is just a bad song. It's a bad fit for Street Fighter. It doesn't feel right, but it's one of the few songs from an anime I actually know, so I just hit the button on it. I hope it works for you guys. Good luck. So I you mean, mean it was a bit of a blind pick? Boo! I hate, I hate it. Hate it. Don't hate the next song, though. I, this next song, though, is one of... Not, I know I keep saying this, but like, I, when I was just sitting around like wanting like fun and animated just to watch, uh, about two years ago, I sat down and found the anime Simpho Gear, a anime that was a magical girl show, but had fantastic music all around, uh, we were talking about earlier with uh, how say you bo go into uh, both the voice acting position and the uh, and writing and singing the openings. Um, the singer Nanamazuki is one of the leads within the anime, um, and it it doubles both as a Ode to like one of the characters from this character, from the character that Nana plays, but also as a triumphant, uh, final battle. Like the good guys are finally getting into get that final punch on the uh main villain of the. Well, what do they call season. it again? An image song? A visual song? There's a word for this sort of thing. That's a that's a character theme, especially. A theme yeah. about a character, not a character in played theme. Mm. I'm trying to remember. I think it's an image song. Is that right? Does that sound right to you guys? It sounds right. Sounds familiar um, to me. I don't know. But in for context, the part of this that is not in there is actually an orchestral bit that sort of leads up into it, where the here where the heroes are down, but like everybody is starting to get back up. Power of friendship starts driving up, and then the song hits. That's where the concert version starts. And as far as, far as the concert version goes, uh, I, I have I have to say, she knows how to put a show. She does. Um, yeah, I got a real Broadway vibe from this. I got to be honest. Uh, this this just felt like a big kind of over the top, almost Andrew Lloyd Webber kind of thing. I actually do really like this song. Uh, it's got again, it's like the big rock opera thing. I'm I'm going to make a terrible reference to anyone who watches uh, an internet reviewer by the name of Todd. The Shadows is about to laugh at, but I was oh boy, like, here we go. This is like sticks. What they, what sticks was trying to accomplish with Kilroy was here, but way way better. <laughs> Am I wrong? You were right about you were right about how how I would laugh at that and uh, not wrong. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Granted, also, that, thank, that's thank not you, a particularly of... high bar. Also, thank you, guys, folks in chat, for confirming that it is indeed an image song. Thank you. <laughs> and um, now, now I have Mister Roboto in my head. Sorry. Well, There's now both... I have. 
as songs from the band Image in my head. There's both the like orchestral part that's left out from the concert thing, and then the there was a version of the opening that sort of it that glorious break flows into. That is a little bit slower, but more exacting, like forcing, like it and of the villain, like being like, "I'm not gonna let you beat me so easily." I'm. If I'm going out, you're going out with me moments. And this, the whole scene that this song is in is amazing. And it's amazing on its own as well. It's able to hold up even outside of that scene. You're able to think of that, of a similar scene within your head because of that, the fact that it picks up that image so well. Yeah, I haven't watched Sing for Gear, but you tell me about anime comeback story, got it. I have a song in my head, and that's that kind of song. It really that is kind that of kind of, of song. But what's interesting is this got stuck in my head for a completely unrelated reason. Uh -huh. Um, So when I first heard this song on the playlist, I'm like, this melody line sounds super familiar. Where have I heard it before? Where have I heard it before? Where have I heard it before? Oh, right, a video game. Yeah, uh, I, know, I know, guys. I'm sorry. What do you want from me? Um, come on! But yeah, this melody line was ripped off. The, the main melody line was ripped off pretty hardcore by Masayoshi Soka in Final Fantasy XIV for the boss fight to Suzaku. Mm. And I know that Sam plays it, and I know that Rana plays it. Tell me I'm wrong right now. I'm, I'm not a gamer, hearing, so I, I can't. I'm hearing it in my head, da, and I can't. Da, 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 da. Da 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 that, that ah! whole line is in there. I, I'm not a gamer, so I can speak for it. Sorry. That... Now I can't get that out of my head. God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's what's running through my head right now. I'm like, how did this song that I've heard once get stuck in... Oh, but the because thing is, I is haven't it, heard it once. It, it, it's a... Because... It is a really good melody line. It's a good melody line, and I'm pretty sure that both composers based it on something more traditional. It sounds that way. Yeah. So it's I'm probably... Content, I'm content to ruin the episode and the sensitivity of the podcast with video <laughs> game stuff. Galen now ruins some of Zeval's favorite song. Yeah. <sighs> it's not that it ruins it. It actually makes it so that it's like, huh... Both songs are good, and both songs are improved because they have the scale around it. Yeah. They d different plays on a theme. I like how both songs work with it. Yes, but if we don't blame him, then we can't guilt him into doing more work for us. Work with me here. If we guilt him that much, he'll leave. <laughs> okay, maybe. Help me! I'm chained to my desk. <laughs> Be happy you're not in the basement anymore. Okay. Now then, uh, something else about Glorious Bright? Um, I mean, I think that I've covered most of my points with it. It's... It, it also... F One final thing, it... It is one of the only songs on this list that I feel follows the flow of a tradition, a, a an anime song in the modern day, of the like slash song in the modern day of like chorus yes. of uh verse chorus verse chorus bridge verse chorus. I mean that's just pretty standard composition yeah. to begin. It, it's abacab. It's not. Mm -hmm. That's pretty standard compositional technique in general. Yeah. This song is also, hey, guess what? Very Japanese, too much, but that's not a that's not to its detriment in this case. This is a really yeah. well-constructed song. This is a lot of fun. So let's cool it down a little bit. Well, With something slightly less Japanese, maybe. Something did you, did you weirdly... Put some... Did you put a Western song on this list? 
Yeah, how oh. about in the words of Adam Cole? Uh, wait, no, Adam Page, go for some cowboy stuff. So, this anime is weird. Uh, it's called Gun Sword. Some people might be familiar because it's one of the big mecha anime. Uh, Do, does it have guns and all swords? Yes. In Good, fact, proceed. The the main character has a sword that he uses to summon a big mecha from a satellite, and that big mecha drops onto the planet in the form of a sword before turning into a humanoid. Ah, yeah, so a traditional spaghetti western then. Yeah, that sounds very western. <laughs> the, the The entire show is very weird because it's a mixture of uh, basically the plotline to kill Bill, where the main character's Vengeance uh, story, got it. Yeah, in this in this case, the main character is male, so his wife was killed at the altar, and he's hunting the killer, and he has to go through his uh, assassins to go to reach him. But it's in a planet that's very western based, except sometimes it's kind of Las Vegas inspired, in some cities. And it has mecha, a lot of mecha, including one that is inspired by uh, Aztec culture. And the okay, group... but is is there a giant mecha with a gigantic poncho somewhere? There might be. It's been some years since I last watched it. Okay. Look, it, it does have it does have a Super Sentai or Power Rangers, uh, basically a parody where it's a group of very old people who once were superheroes, and now they're old geezers who can't do anything, and they are themed after Aztec culture, and they are called the Eldora Five. This sounds dumb, you're kinda selling me on it. Yeah, um... The sh As I, I said, I, the show is weird. I, I will say my uh, mecha standards have been set high with... Uh, Evangelion, Gurren Lagann, and uh, Gundam. But... Yes, yeah, so the anime that ruined Mecha, then. So, I'm just yeah. not a Mecha fan in general, unfortunately. Shogo yeah, Mobile well, Armor Division is about as not... close to the Mecha as I get, and hey, guess what? That's yet another video game. Sorry, guys. At least you're not telling us you're a Magical Girl fan because you watch Madoka. What? I don't think he even knows what what Madoka is. Would someone please explain to me what was just said to me? I feel like you just accused me of something and I have no way of defending so, myself. So... I didn't actually. I don't think... Here's the thing. I don't think you would like Madoka. <laughs> because it's... It goes from being like this, oh, cutesy match girl anime, to really messed up. <laughs> okay. So, I'm actually more for really messed up than not. I mean, depends on the kind of messed up. I yeah, am a Tari Yoko that's fan. that's the thing. It's that... Is that it's uh, I, subverting I, I, a, a genre, and if you it's your entry point to the genre, it sub it kind of ruins what is expected of that genre for you. On the mm -hmm. subject of genres, um, so this song is very much a Western score type of thing, like it's very Sergio Leone inspired. But I got a big problem with the actual song itself and that is the vocals almost sound like a parody i feel like the vocalist has no idea what a western song is actually supposed to sound like i think i understand i think i know exactly what where you're coming from with that and that goes back to how i would like i think i'd like to call it early early like Tr earlier tracks for anime feel of like them trying to get their footing of like what actually works with like working with other genres outside of uh, what they're used to. Yeah, and sometimes you learn something that really, really worked and you get uh, a Cowboy Beaver. And other times you're trying maybe a bit too much without having solid foundations. 
And you get destruct that's pretty enjoyable. It paints a picture. Yeah, it I does. I don't but dislike this own... track, but the vocals are throwing me off. I like this track, but the vocals are really throwing me off. Yeah, the yeah. the soundtrack is pretty much as eclectic as the plot is because you have uh you have a lot of these very western stuff, such as uh, the track we're talking about for those listening is called Desert Rose. Uh, then you have the mariachi stuff. Uh, so yeah, the, the soundtrack is actually about as eclectic as the plot that I described earlier. Because uh, as you've heard with this song, uh, Desert Rose, it, it has a very western vibe to it. Then you have some mariachi stuff for the Eldora 5. You also have some very futuristic sci-fi stuff. Because the main character's uh, mecha is a super futuristic one that is way above what most mecha in this world are capable of doing. So every time he summons his mecha, it comes with a very fut futuristic sound. And then there's a lot of traditional Japanese stuff. Uh, I believe the opening uh, actually has taiko drums. I might be wrong, but I believe the drumming is taiko drums in the, uh, the, anime's op the, the show's opening. So that might explain why it ends up sounding like those early anime where they kind of want to copy western sounds but, but don't know how to do it. That would probably be because they are deliberately mixing that with this traditional Japanese stuff. Because I don't know about you guys, but at least to me, the vocals do sound a lot like uh, some Japanese folk stuff, uh, in my opinion. I can agree with that. Does well, it does clash a little with the Western vibe, though. Uh, there's ways to mix it that I think would have been, yeah. I don't want to say more elegant, but certainly less off-putting. I, I totally understand that, and there's definitely something cool about blending the Japanese folk music and the spaghetti Western uh, scoring music. I just don't think they quite hit the mark on this one, I gotta be honest. Like, I, I, again, I do mostly like the song, but these vocals are just really off-putting to me, and I think there was a way to do this that would have worked a little better. Yeah, I, I can see that. Uh, generally speaking, I, I, I enjoyed the, the soundtrack a bunch. Uh, it's, it's quite easily among my favorite anime soundtracks, to be honest, uh, just because of the variety uh, and how else uh, a lot of it is executed. And uh, Kotaro Nakagawa, the composer, went on to work on a lot of other uh, big name franchises as well. Um, so uh, I I'm particularly very fond of this one and weirdly nostalgic despite having watched it in my uh, mid to late teen, uh, teen years. Uh, but yeah, uh, again, that's pretty much the age where people get into anime for real. So. <laughs> I guess not much new there. On the topic of nostalgia, uh, Rana, your next pick is interesting. It's well, cool. Before I even talk about the song, I feel that I must share with you the story of how I was introduced to Utena. It all started on a fateful evening with somebody I barely know and somebody that wasn't from here. We were having uh, an all-nighter at a time where I really wasn't used to all-nighters at all. We started with some uh, uh, Stephen King movie, then we moved to some Full Metal Panic for Mofu episodes, then it got into the really weird stuff that has these big 3AM vibes, like historical World War II dogfight in Reconstitution movies, because that was the interest of one of the guys, and then some Fumofu episodes back again. So needless to say that by the time things started on the Utena movie, at 4 to 5AM maybe, I was already a broken man. And then you apply the Utena movie to a broken man. How did you survive? Utena is a series and a movie that takes 
cohesion sets it aside and maybe mucks it a little every now and then before doing its thing back again. The ending of the movie, which I'm going to uh, mention without a spoiler tag because a spoiler implies some level of coherency, uh, involves the character entering a hot pu- into a hot pursuit uh, at the behest of uh, shadows on a wall by uh, exiting a magical car washing station and turning into a car, something that the main author mentions has put in the movie because, and I quote, I just wanted to have two girls turn into a car. What? As one does. As one does. As that was the climax of the movie, by the way. And as it ended, I had a little bit of a pause as I tried to process what I just watched. Failed and had a nervous, uninterrupted five minutes laughter in during which I was basically fighting for my life, gasping for air. <laughs> That sounds about right. But it's not an exaggeration. (laughs) Nothing of what I said is an exaggeration or a deformation of the truth. I've never watched it, but I think I've heard of that interview. And Yeah, I'm having like a key memory in my brain where why is... Who said this line? Why is the lesbian bleep a car? (laughs) Why have I heard that line before? And that's got to be a reference to this. Yeah, it's probably an anime video yeah. review somewhere that mentioned that. Yeah. But one of I watched. Needless to say, after that, uh, I then watched the entire 39 episode series. Because that wasn't enough. And uh, in the series, which is very um, structured, which is odd because it's it lacks mundane notions of cohesion in many ways, but at the same time is extremely structured and regular. Well, and you wh- could say that exact the same thing about is... the song. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, the thing is that they have about, I think, 15, a, a bit more than 15 duels throughout the series in three main sub sort of. And each of those duels has a different song. This is the song for the first duel, which is named and stars the lyrics when, where, who, which. Which is pretty easily mentionable as a reflection of the protagonist's utter confusion at the fact that she's currently dueling some weird green-haired guy over this girl she doesn't even know just because he was a bit of a prick about this girl. And basically uh, ends up sword fighting him with a broom. And gets lucky. Okay. The the more that I hear about this, the more that I'm glad that certain things in more recent anime have at least a little more cohesion. (laughs) Oh, don't worry, Ikuhara continues working to this day. There's room uh, for insanity you... out there. There's room for complete balls-out insanity yeah. out there. Uh, there if you've there heard is, of, the, it's if just... you've heard of uh, Maru, Maru Penguin Drum or Lesbian Burstorm, uh, it's his work, too. Yeah, uh, I, I gotta be honest, I could go without ever hearing this song again. Um, This is in the Blind by Corn. uh sense of um man this is just written like complete just no i this song gets a no for me so i have a thing to say about this really quick okay It, it has there is a vibe that i get from it that i know very well from listening to a bunch of other anime tracks from other anime that came out around the time that this one specifically came out uh, and the only way that I can describe it is old anime music, uh, old anime music, because of the fact that it is when it is part of that era that they were trying stuff. It is part of that 
era where the composition was questionable. But when but the songs that hit hit and the ones that didn't really didn't. <laughs> Except for some that liked it. Like I do. Don't get me wrong, all of the picks I picked for today's episode are songs I genuinely like, and this one is included. It's this oppressive destructor dirge that just goes hard and uh, reflects the, yeah, this sense of panic while having this uh, uh, almost non-stop uh, voice. I mean, I'm, I've always been a big fan of uh, voice used as an instrument sort of thing, because besides the uh, titular one uh, who which, I haven't really looked that much into the lyrics and they're not the most... Uh, understanding them isn't the most relevant thing to uh, appreciate the track, if you do. Oh, yeah, that's fine. I, I almost yeah. never pay attention to lyrics. Um, But you guys may or may not know this about me. Uh, but one well, of my But you like biggest... video games? Ha 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 ha. Yes, I do. But no, that's not relevant here. Uh, one of my least favorite musical tropes is stopping and starting really hard. Um, and I remember once upon a time in an alternate universe, we talked about a track in which, Rana, you picked one that had a lot of starting and stopping, and in this alternate universe, I hated it. Um, this one has a similar yeah, effect because like... the vocals are really staccato and really just start, word, this, I... Oh my god, I want to strangle whoever wrote that sequence. <laughs> that's just, like, so grating to me. And that's mm -hmm. the only reason I just like this song. I feel like I would probably like it if the vocals were a lot smoother. There are things you just should well, not do to a human voice, and that is it. Well, mm -hmm. good news. Uh, you know what other song from Utena also starts with some very uh, hard, hard delimited uh, words? Uh, the song that happens right before the duel, the can sequence where they get up-ish to the arena, which happens in every single duel episode, which means that you hear it about 20 times throughout the anime. Oh, oh that God. would just drive me up a wall! <laughs> uh, hey Galen, do you think we should move on? Yes! Okay, but I swear if that's a metal track you don't like, I will slap a sheep. Well, it's none of those things because it's progressive rock and I absolutely love this song. And what is it? Okay, but what by what bond is it? Yes. Yes? Okay, no, you said that. Yes. Okay, but who's on two? Roundabout by Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, the JoJo song. Fucking JoJo. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> JoJo is one of the reasons why I don't like anime, and that is much like the Princess Bride. I have been so inundated by memes. I'm pretty sure I've seen the entire show and hate each second of it. <laughs> Good. I was going to ask: Is it because of JoJo, or is it because of JoJo fans? It's the latter. I, I, there is the, the old joke about how uh, you know a JoJo fan because they will let you know that they are JoJo fans. You mean there's a <laughs> JoJo joke about that? I wish I had a drum set to do a rim shot. Um, no, I, I don't have a whole lot of love for what I have seen of JoJo, but I will absolutely admit there to be continued music being a classic of 80s progressive rock in the form of Roundabout is just, that is just primo music supervision right there. It's I, a great track. I will say that that is one of, that was probably one of the things that uh, the mangaka, uh, Hirohiko Araki, actually put in because of the fact that a lot, and I mean a lot, in the, anim in the whole uh, 
thing is based around music. What music references in my JoJo's Bizarre Adventures? Like bet between Dio Brando being yeah, every single stand name, every single stand name, besides like Magicians Red and Star Platinum and Silver Chariot, uh, is music based. <laughs> Well, the music. If I recall correctly, there was even issues when dubbing because they had uh, copyright issues with using those names. So much, so many. Uh, the thing the is that the music they... industry is no joke when it comes to that stuff. Yeah. Um, it's one of the reasons why I'm like scared for a certain stand in the next part of JoJo to be coming out because it's uh. Dirty D's done dirt cheap. And do you want to oh, know yeah. what their localization of that is? Oh, this I gotta hear. Filthy acts at a reasonable price. Nice! <laughs> nice! That is awful and I love it. Uh, oh, um. So, and yes, is yeah. most. So, yeah, that, that's a roundabout way to name it. Yeah. Thing. So Yes is mostly known for Owner of a Lonely Heart, which is their biggest hit, but they have 5, 10, 15, 20, 24 albums. They have a That's long a history tracks. in progressive rock. Oh, yeah. And the fact that this song gets some love always makes me happy, and this is a killer track, too. God, that bass line is so good. Oh, yeah. Doom, doom. So you brought a so you brought a song you actually liked to the podcast. I did. I did bring a song I actually liked to the podcast. The ships will remain unslept. Yeah, this was Chris Squire uh, on bass, uh, who was their bassist until his untimely death in 2015. Um, and like I am a sucker for a good bass line. Like when you see a bassist really go hard, it's great. Um. And this guy just does not mess around. The guitars are great. John Anderson is at his best on vocals. This is just, this is just a wonderful track and a wonderful example of what Yes is capable of at their best. Um, yeah, because it's one of the, it's a really good, really good track. Yeah, I actually, it's one of the endings that I'll actually like sit through because. Fun, th fun fact about anime watchers, a lot of the time, they just watch, they either listen to the anime one, anime ending once, and just leave it, or they'll just skip the anime ending entirely. Yep, I can tell you a couple of that, but let's keep that for a special endings episode that we're bound to do at some point. Of course. Fair enough. <laughs> um... Though this track, the fact that it exists outside of uh, its original context, it just makes it an excellent pig because it has ending energy. It does. Even though it wasn't made yeah. for that, it has this chill wind down vibe of an ending track. It does, but even then, like, I'm even as someone who isn't a fan of anime in general, or this show in particular, still associate it mentally with that to-be-continued screen. I didn't even know what show it was from, I'm so familiar with that. I had to ask you guys, only to learn it was JoJo, at which point I immediately facepalmed that I dared bring JoJo into this mess. <laughs> um, but the music yeah, itself... It was, uh, it was during a year, uh, I don't remember which one, but mimed to death, basically. Yeah. It was mimed to death, but for that's one that's... of the only JoJo memes that actually works to me. Because For the song that... is that good. Show me, show me something from JoJo that hasn't been memed to death. Okay, fair point. Give me, like, give me like an hour, I could throw you up a couple examples. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> oh god, please Save don't. Save me! <laughs> what, kidding. you're going to find an anime that has Evanescence in the track now? Okay, like you want me to go off on a tangent of, of Evanescence, movie. man, they sold out hard, but if you actually listen to their original demos pre that first album, they actually probably could have been a really interesting metal band if they didn't go to that I, gothic rock land. I think, I can't remember which YouTube channel it was, I think it was Ben's playing, might have been someone, someone different, 
made a video on the career of Evanescence. <laughs> and basically, everything you associate with the Evanescence sound from that album, that first album that got big, was uh, executive meddling. I'm mm-hmm. not even... Yeah. I've heard their demos. I know that to be true. Okay, yeah, they, but that's the, the rapper... Home. Like the the track uh, wake like, like like wake me up. Uh, I can't remember if that's the tr- the yeah. track title. Wake me up before yeah. you go go. Yeah, you have the the dude in the the rapping in the back in between verses from the from Emmy Lee, and that guy he was only there because the SX went. Guys, new metal is big right now. You gotta have a rapper. Mm-hmm. So unless this thing is like an Evangelion, are we are we on track still, guys? <laughs> I don't know what we're doing anymore. Why did you invite me to this? I mean, you brought some nice, some cool songs. Thanks. You asked to be taken out of the basement. We took you out of the basement. And we said, prove yourself. That's a real double-edged sword now, isn't it? Well. I don't know how to follow that up either. Neither do I. It's such a shame we can't, uh have the the part of the track uh, as our outro as we pretend something's going to happen yeah <laughs> you know if you want me maybe yeah. maybe if we talked about video games more i would have something actually to contribute but you guys dragged me into this and i don't know what the heck you were expecting well look it's not like we're going to do something like make a video game specific podcast episode or something well why yeah. not <laughs> i mean It'll never work. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. Well, at least we got we got this done for the day. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And remember, if you want to send us a message, we still haven't fixed our email address, so it is still music.rk.podcast at gmail.com. And if, you, and if you want more, be sure to let us know on the stream. And the comments. Thank I you. I can't believe someone stole the, the email music anime club at Gmail. Hmm. Well, we'll figure that out later. Anyway, thanks everyone for coming out. We'll see you later. Back to the mines. No.